Hi everyone, uh, my name is Zach Lingley. I work in Dr. Dugar's group. Today I'm going to tell you about synthesis of lead sulfide quantum dots or non radiative energy transfer based solar energy conversion. So, to begin my talk, I'd like to address the question what are quantum dots and why are we using them? To answer the first question briefly, is that quantum dots are materials that are, have electronic confinement in three directions. That means, as opposed to a bulk material, we have electrons traveling as plane waves with a characteristic wavelength called the de Broglie wavelength, you've taken a material and reduced it so that the size of the material is actually smaller or on the same order of magnitude as the de Broglie wavelength. And this has many effects. You're forcing the electron wavelength to actually change length, change frequency. And by doing this, you change the energy of the electrons. So here is an image of a quantum dot, which is on the scale of 1.5 nanometers. And just the physical boundary of the material is now forced the electron to be confined in a very small area in such a way that you're changing the properties of it. And this has the effect of increasing the kinetic energy of the electrons and therefore separating the energy levels um, in the material. So this is demonstrated in these images here, which are cadmium selenide nanoparticle quantum dots that only differ in size. So you can see that when their cadmium selenide nanoparticles are 5 nanometers in diameter, they emit red light, whereas if you reduce the size to 2 nanometers, you emit blue light. So we're interested in these particles for the absorption properties. Light absorption is a process by which you have an electron in one state, it absorbs energy through the electric field of a photon and is transferred to a final state. Intuitively, you can understand that in order to enhance this process, you want the initial state and the final state to be in a very confined spatial area. So if the two states are in the same space, you can enhance the absorption prob probability. So quantum dots intuitively and intrinsically will absorb light very efficiently. So we want to use this property of high absorption in quantum dots for solar energy conversion. Currently, quantum dots are used in, in solar energy conversion in a, um, in a scheme like this. This is one example where we have quantum dots that are dispersed in a conducting polymer matrix. So in schemes like this that are involving quantum dots for solar energy, we do in fact um, exploit the high absorption so you can create many electron hole pairs in the quantum dots. So you can separate the two charges into the different materials. So you can take the hole from the quantum dot and put it into the conducting polymer in which the quantum dots are dispersed. But now you're limited by the mobility of the, of the polymer. So you can create the charges, but in order to extract it in any kind of useful energy, you're limited by the very low conductivity of the medium. So you create charges, you separate them, but then you can't actually create a current from the, the charge carriers. So what our work is focused on is how we can overcome the limitations of inefficient transport. And we propose to do this by a process in which both the electron and hole are transported or transferred simultaneously to a second transport channel material. And we can choose this transport channel material in such a way that it has very high conductivity or mobility for both the electron and the hole. In fact, it's over a thousand times higher than the polymer. So we can exploit the absorption of the quantum dot and we can take that energy and put it into a transport material in which we can effectively extract it into useful current. The mechanism of this simultaneous transfer of electron and hole into a transport channel is a non-radiated energy transfer via a dipole-dipole interaction. This is also called foster resonant energy transfer in the biological community and it's um, been understood for quite some time. It's actually the process involved in your eye as you, your eye absorbs light, the energy from the light absorbed in your eye transferred into the neural network that tells your brain what you're seeing is initiated by this same exact process. The law describing the efficiency of this process was given by Foster, and it follows this equation here. So here we have the radiative lifetime of the quantum dot, and it's multiplied by a uh, factor shown here, which is uh, Foster radius R0 divided by the separation between the quantum dot and the transport channel to a power n. n is a dimensionality factor which depends on the materials involved and their electronic structure. So for example, if you have a quantum dot which is zero to zero degrees, or zero dimensions in the electronic structure, and you have a bulk material which the energy is being transferred to, 
this n takes the value of 3. All of the material properties involved for both the uh, quantum dot, the energy donor, and the transport channel, the energy acceptor, is included in this constant called the Foster radius, R0. R0 uh, is obviously very important, so if we want to enhance the Foster rate, or enhance the probability of having the energy transfer from the quantum dot to the transport channel, you need to have this factor be greater than 1 and as large as possible, or else um, the radiated decay rate, which is just an emission of a photon, would be the dominant process. So to, in R0, the Foster radius is depending on the quantum efficiency of the quantum dot or the donor, and also um, this integral here, which is was the product of the emission, uh, donor emission spectrum and the acceptor absorption spectrum. So what this is telling you is that in order to have efficient transfer, you need to match the energy levels of the quantum dot or the donor and the transport channel. So this is our idea for solar energy conversion, and the rest of my talk will be discussing how we design and synthesize this portion only, just the quantum dot, so we can use it as a suitable mechanism or a suitable material for transport or to donate energy into the transport channel. So we've chosen the lead sulfide quantum dot system. We've chosen this because we can adjust the absorption to cover most of the solar spectrum and for some other reasons, but the main idea is that we can take the lead sulfide nanoparticles and adjust them so they absorb over the entire solar spectrum. To create lead sulfide nanoparticles, we use thermolysis of two precursors, a lead source, which is lead oleate, dissolved in a high-rolling high organic solvent, and we rapidly inject a sulfur precursor, um, first molecule, trimethyl disyl thylane, which is just a sulfur source for our reaction. We combine them rapidly, and we initiate a nucleation and growth process. To remind you guys what the nucleation and growth process is, and to point out some important factors that we use to design our quantum dots, I've shown a, a diagram here, which is um, pointing out the important parts of nucleation and growth. So on this graph, I plotted the concentration of sulfur precursor, which in my reaction is the limiting reagent as a function of time. So you initiate the experiment by actually injecting the sulfur precursor into the solution. So you're manually increasing the concentration just by combining the two chemicals. And when you reach the a threshold of high enough concentration, you induce nucleation, which is basically just saying uh, the constituents are coming together faster than they're associating. And the nucleation will only occur until the con only occur as long as the concentration is above a certain threshold, in which case you still have a large concentration of monomers in solution, but now that all these monomers can only be added to the particles that, ex that are existing. So you have a growth stage. So you're not creating any more quantum dots, you're just growing the, the quantum dots that are already present. So when we do this, we want we want to see what we have in fact created, and the best way to do that is by transmission electron microscopy. So here is an actual image of the lead sulfide quantum dots we made. This is the base contrast image that's showing you the contrast from uh, 111 planes, two sets of 111 planes in a lead sulfide quantum dot. Um, so we can actually measure the spacing of the planes to identify the crystal structure directly. So these planes have a separation of 3.4 angstroms, which is consistent with bulk lead sulfide or the lead sulfide structure of rock salt, which has a large parameter of 5.9 angstrom. So we can, in fact, identify that we are creating what we want, lead sulfide nanoparticles. And we, we see like an interesting shape of evolution of our nanoparticles. So at small sizes, roughly 4 nanometers, you have spheres to maximize the um, volume to surface energy ratio. And interestingly, we notice that when you have these small spheres, they arrange themselves in four full symmetry packing which is counterintuitive because you can only, if you let some of the particles arrange or anything self-assemble, it wants to become six-fold symmetric to do close packing. And you see as a transition from small particles that are spheres to large particles that become cubes. What this is telling us is that we have an anisotropic growth, and we have growth that's fastest on some crystal facets than others. And in this structure, rock salt is cubic, and the growth rate is slowest on the 100 planes, sorry, the 100 planes. So if you allow the crystals to grow, they become cubes. So now that I've shown you that we can, in fact, make the quantum dots, um, I'm going to describe how we can tune the properties of them to, to match our choices of 
energy um, acceptor or transport channel. 